show. My name is David Bigalki. I'm the host for today's show. Uh, I have with me today a veteran of um, the United States Navy, uh, veteran of operations in support of Kosovo, uh, Steve Decker. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, let's, if you're ready, we'll begin. Uh, why don't you tell us where you were born, when you were born, sure. about uh, your childhood. I was, uh, I was born in Madison, Wisconsin in 1979. Um, grew up in uh, Wisconsin Dells and uh, was kind of crazy growing up. I didn't have a whole lot of discipline. I think that was uh, one of the main reasons I, uh, I chose uh, going into the service after high school. Um, and I, I did enlist uh, right after high school. I went to a, a military academy for high school too. So that fit very well with me going into the military. Um, enlisted in the Navy in the summer of 97 and uh, I went to boot camp in Great Lakes, um, which is now the only boot camp for the Navy. And took a lot of advice from my father, who was an Army veteran, who he was drafted in Vietnam, and my grandpa, who was a, a, a Navy veteran in World War II. So uh, they had uh, great influences. My other grandpa was an Army veteran, too. So uh, took a lot of cues from them and kind of followed in the family footsteps, so to speak, and in, in joining the military. And, well, then why don't you tell us about your, uh, F, like, boot camp or what you did in the military? Sure. Boot camp was, uh, was honestly easier than I expected. Going to a military academy probably set me up um, pretty well as far as being in physical shape and, and having the mentality of uh, uh, somebody in charge, taking orders, that kind of stuff. So. Uh, following boot camp, um, I went to, I enlisted at, at my rate was aviation electronics technician. Um, they, uh, they pushed really hard for me to go uh, into the, what's called the nuke program, but I missed the test by one point, and I think it was the best test I ever failed. So I uh, got to uh, Pensacola in September, August, October, end of October in 2000, or 97 and uh, started my, what they call A school um, down there, which was a six month long school. Uh, ironically, all the people who failed out of the nuke program came to my A school. So <laughs> I had to hear all the horror stories of what they had to go through and um, then they had to go through what I had to go through too. But uh, Pensacola was great, um, neat environment. A um, little bit of an extension of boot camp in a way. A lot of the people that were there um, did come directly from boot camp. So uh, to keep them from going crazy, they, they kind of kept the same mentality um, from one environment to the other. But uh, I was there for six months. And while I was there, the teachers told me, uh, the instructors of the classes said, uh, the uh, person who finishes number one in the class, as far as GPA, gets to pick their orders. So that's what I did, and that's what my focus was. I uh, put all the effort I had into graduating number one in the school, and I did. And I picked uh, P-3s, which is uh, P-3 Orion, which is an anti-submarine aircraft. And uh, I picked it because it's too big to fit on a carrier, because uh, uh, it was pretty clumsy <laughs> as a six foot five, 18 year old. So I didn't want to mm -hmm. go on a, on a ship. So I, uh, I picked P-3s out of Brunswick, Maine. The uh, squadron I was stationed with was uh, VP-8, the Fighting Tigers. There's a lot of history with that squadron and the other three squadrons, the sister squadrons that were there too, VP-10 and VP-26. Uh, Brunswick Naval Air Station, I believe now, is shut down. They moved it all down to Jacksonville, Florida. So it's kind of sad to see, but um, kind of saw it coming. So, but VP-8 was, was pretty neat. I arrived at, uh, at VP-8 right before they deployed to Puerto Rico in 1998. So. They were uh, just, like I said, preparing for deployment. Um, Puerto Rico, that deployment was what they called a tri-site. The squadron got split up into three separate squadrons. Um, one part of the squadron went to Keflavik, Iceland. The other went to uh, Rosie Roads, Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico, which is a naval station down there. And the other third of it went to Panama when it was still in US control. So. 
the main focus of the operations out of Puerto Rico and Panama were um, anti-drug, um, drug smuggling operations, worked uh, hand in hand with the United States Coast Guard to intercept some of the, what they called, go fasts, um, the boats that they would uh, bring the, uh, and even submarines that they would bring the drugs in on um, from, from Panama and from Colombia. So uh, we got to see a lot of the, use a lot of really high tech gadgets to, uh, to get them a lot of uh, uh, real neat stuff, a lot of stuff that's still classified, but um, pretty cool, pretty cool stuff to work on as an aviation electronics tech. Um, my job specifically as an aviation electronics tech was uh, to take care of the bombing, uh, radios, navigation, uh, satellite, uh, visual stuff. Um, so that was, it was really neat. Everything, was, every day was something different. Those aircraft are probably going on 50 years old, so they broke a lot, so. So that's, that was uh, what you did, you said near Panama? Yep, yep. Um, what about Kosovo? Um, Kosovo, we, that was the second deployment I did. Um, we had a 12 month, uh, 12 month delay in, in between deployments, so after, Puerto Rico, we were home for a year, and then we got deployed to um, Siganelli, Sicily, which is the little island off the boot of Italy. And uh, we supported the NATO operations in Kosovo from Siganella. And basically, my role at that point in time was uh, working in the line shack, they called it, uh, recovering and launching the aircraft, um, assisting the maintenance crews in either cooling the aircraft or moving the aircraft to where they needed to do put it in order to work on it kind of stuff. So um, had to do a lot of uh, alert launches, um, alert, I know um, planes came back broken, had to, uh, there were special things we had to do in order to make sure it was recovered safely and everybody kept their heads. So it was, it was a hot job. The thing I remember the most about Siganella was the heat. Um, and I was told while I was there that the wind shifted um, the month after we got there um, it's a seasonal thing, and it blows north across the Sahara Desert, across the Mediterranean, and, and hits the southern end of Italy, and it was so hot. Even at night, it was hot. And we used to uh, have to put paper um, on the wings of the airplane, so if you were walking on the airplane, your boots wouldn't melt on the wings um, and leave little tar footprints all over. Uh, we would have to, or we would take bottles of water and pour it on the cement, if we had to stand in one spot for a while, because it would cook your feet, and uh, having hot, sweaty feet for 12 hours a day is not, not a, not a good, uh, not a good decision. But we, uh, we did some. Um, there were some weapon firings off of that aircraft, which is a, a new thing. They, they installed uh, special programs and special mounts on the airplane to be able to launch missiles. Um, the Maverick missile was launched out of there, and we, we did have some successful target acquisitions and, and kills um, on the aircraft that, that were in my squadron and uh, the sister squadrons. So uh, that was neat to be a part of. And uh, I think one of the airplanes, and this story got, I didn't actually see it, the airplane, but it was either our squadron or a sister squadron that was there took uh, ground fire, small arms ground fire in one of the wings. And uh, they didn't lose the plane or anything, and it was only noticed upon return. So it wasn't something they really freaked out about until they actually landed the plane. But that was, uh, that was our mission over there. Um, 12 hours a day deployments. You had 12-hour work weeks until you had a day off. So it didn't really matter what day it was, Monday or Tuesday. It was 12 on, one day off, and then 12 on again, 12 hours a day, and it was uh, it was heck. Six months was probably about all somebody can take of that. So, um, anything else about the uh, supporting Kosovo? Um, or anything else you'd like to talk about? Because because it was a war zone, technically a war zone. There was a, there was a huge push for people that were in the um, in my squadron to. Uh, to re-enlist um, over Kosovo while they were flying missions over Kosovo because it was tax-free uh, in a war zone. And if you re-enlisted in a war zone, then your re-enlistment bonus was also tax-free. 
<laughs> so that was uh, just one of the funny things that I remember from, from being over there is, is the huge push to people, the people to try to get on those planes and do that while they were over Kosovo. But, mm. OK. Mm. How about recreation? What do you do for fun? There was, because it was Italy, um, there were there were a lot of opportunities to get out and see some really historic stuff while we were over there. Um, unfortunately, the work schedule kind of prohibited it. By the time you got that day off, you didn't really want to do anything. Um, but I did get a chance um, on one of the days off to go up uh, up the coast. Uh, the, there's an active volcano, Mount Etna, that's in Sicily. It's the only active volcano. I believe it's the only active uh, volcano in the Mediterranean. And uh, got to go see that. Um, got to see some of the little uh, Italian towns in the area and eat some real good, real good Italian food. So that was uh, that was our recreation besides the the, the stereotypical sailors at the bar. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, driving over there was crazy. Um, it was uh, you know everything is in kilometers. You drive on the correct side of the road, but. Um, there aren't any rules to the road. The speed limits are just a guide to follow. Um, there were several times where you know, we'd be out driving around, uh, whether it be from one base to the other or uh, various places where you'd be passed um, by somebody going the other direction, and then your mirrors would click um, because they were so close. And just an entirely different driving atmosphere over there. But uh, it was good. I think it helped my driving over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But uh, there was, uh, we did a, a, deploy a detachment, a couple of detachments over there. Um, one of them was to Turkey. We went to Turkey and flew operations out of Turkey for, again, in support of uh, the Kosovo mission. And we got to stay at a, um, it's a German resort over there, and I can't remember the name of it, but we flew into, um, I believe it's in Cirklik, Turkey. Um, but the German resort was right on the Mediterranean, um, which was wonderful to swim in, wonderful to play. Um, the Turkish people were very friendly, very open culture over there. Um, went to a jewelry store. I was looking for to get my my dad a, uh, a silver pocket watch, just because it seemed like something neat to do. And they actually gave me the watch to take it home for the night, and said if I didn't like it, to bring it back in the morning. And uh, there's no way in heck you'd do that over here in America. I think so. <laughs> but you'd, you'd do something wrong over there, they chop your hand off. So. Oh. <laughs> yes. But, uh, There's good and the bad. Yeah, good and the bad, definitely. But uh, very friendly, very open, very welcoming. I'm sure because we were in the Navy and they thought we had the money. So, um, But it was, uh, it was a neat place to see, it was a neat to experience. So you said you were there for six months? Six months in Turkey. Yeah. And or then six months in Italy. Uh, two weeks in Turkey. And what about after that? Um, after Turkey, I uh, was back to Brunswick. Um, and that was nearing the end of my uh, four-year four enlistment. So uh, two deployments, uh, four years. Uh, Brunswick, Maine was terrible in the winter. Um, the flight line was a big block, a big sheet of ice. Um, the snow plows, the snow over there was, was bizarre. Um, there's times when the airplanes land, they can't use their brakes or any kind of um, they have to use their engines to stop, so they reverse props. And there are several times that, you know, recovering and launching those airplanes on that I, that sheet of ice that they'd reverse props and blow the wind back at you in order to stop, and you'd go tumbling and sliding away just because the, there was nothing, to, there was no footing on ice. It was pretty hairy a lot of times, pretty cold. Um, but nobody seemed to get hurt when I was there. Okay, I guess then uh, what about afterwards? Um, after, the, after the military? Yes. Um, after I got off of active duty, um, I was right before, was in July of 2001, so just a couple of months before September 11, uh, 01. Um, September 11th happened, and I was already planning on, but it kind of sped up my desire to go back into the, uh, into the service in the reserves. Um, so I was out in Colorado at the time um, go, as a student, and I joined, uh, joined the reserves there. Um, actually had a P3 squadron that would pick people up in Colorado Springs. 
um, and fly us out to, it was a VP-94 out of uh, uh, New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. So they'd pick us up one weekend a month and fly us down to New Orleans for the weekend and um, we would you know, do what we were supposed to do, work on the planes, learn new things, uh, drill uh, up accordingly and they'd fly us home on Sunday night. So it was, it was a neat thing to be a part of, um, especially immediately after 9-11 because um, there was a great sense of pride there. Um, after 2001, probably about six months after I joined the reserves, my father passed away uh, from cancer from Agent Orange in Vietnam. Um, he was a Vietnam vet, was drafted in 69. Uh, I came back to Wisconsin and uh, transferred to the CB detachment out of Madison, the uh, uh, Naval Marine Corps Construction Battalion, um, DET 25, which is based out of um, Fort McCoy, but our, our detachment was out of, uh, out of Madison. So we would go to Madison and drill, uh, do small uh, squad training, platoon training. Um, the Marine Corps was based there too, so we got to use some of their gear too to uh, to, to practice our, our, our shooting and our, our squad drills and stuff like that. So um, the CBs were, were really cool, uh, really neat unit to be a part of. Um, their motto is, we build, we fight, and they did it right alongside the Marine Corps. So there was a, a great bond there developed with the, the Marines that we were, we were partnered with. Um, a lot of really uh, uh, interesting places to go. Uh, we did a summer. Um, um, a government-sponsored program out in Williston, North Dakota um, that we built. Um, it was on the Lewis and Clark Trail, and it was uh, uh, a building that looked like a boat that Lewis and Clark would have used. And it was uh, my first actual construction project that I worked on with them, and I spent the whole summer out there, and I, I learned a lot. Um, I got injured a couple times, dropped some things on people's feet, you know, that kind of stuff. But uh, overall, it was a it was a great experience. The CBs were were a great group of guys, and uh, my initial enlistment was up in 2004, and I left. I was about to graduate from college, and about four months after I left, my unit got called up and deployed to Iraq. So I did not have the opportunity to go on that. I I felt a, a, a quite a bit of regret that all my friends were going. But I, I wasn't, um, and or couldn't. So, uh, but the, everybody that that I knew came back okay, and Good. it was a. They say it was a, a pretty rough experience, and they were jealous that I got to stay home. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> but uh, being over there, not so much being over there, but being with being with my friends and being with my pals would have been um, the reason I would have gone, okay. just sharing the misery with them. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess anything else? Anything you might have forgot? Otherwise, uh, has your military uh, made your civilian life? How has it changed your civilian life? Uh, I found it a great bullet on my resume. Um, it's really nice uh, uh, to be able to talk about this kind of stuff with employers. To, to come into something like this and them not have to worry about how disciplined you're going to be or how you're going to react to somebody uh, telling you what to do. Um, in my current job now, I'm a, uh, uh, an insurance investigator, and that comes with that a certain amount of freedom. I work out of my house, you know, I have to be accountable. The military really taught me how to be accountable. Um, the, uh, I have found that um, even if I'm only given 50%, it's probably about 150% better than what people who aren't in the military give on their average day. So um, even if I feel like I'm personally slacking off a little bit, um, nine times out of 10, it's above and beyond what they were expecting anyway. So mm -hmm. um, that takes a little, get, a little bit getting used to. That was um, different. Um, but you know the the Wisconsin uh, Department of Veteran Affairs has has great educational programs that I took advantage of once you're out. Um, went to college here on the uh, the GI Bill. Um, that was a great uh, a great investment in my future. Something I don't think I would have been able to do without it. 
Um, and accordingly, I was the first uh, person in my family to graduate from college. So that was a, a great sense of pride. So um, I owe a whole lot to being in the military. Um, good experience, good leadership. Um, it translates real well to the civilian world. Mm -hmm. um, if I had the chance to do it again, I think I would. Um, but life status right now is is a lot different than when I was when I was 18. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, when I when I came home, you know, it was it was great to to do it. It was kind of sad to do it under the in the context that they did it because my dad was in the process of of dying with cancer. So. Um, it was all about him at that point. Uh, not so much a, a great homecoming for me, but kind of a, a bittersweet homecoming because I was coming to stay with him. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm still friends with a lot of the people that I was in the service with. And camaraderie there is, uh, there's nothing to bring people together than suffering. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, I don't know if that's the way they plan it or mean it, but uh, the, the bond you build when you're miserable is, is a stronger bond than than, than a lot of other bonds. Um, the, uh, one of my best friends in, on active duty was the best man in my wedding, and we still keep in touch. Um, it's, uh, it, it really does build lifelong friendships, and it, it, it's neat to, be, to have that experience. OK. Well, then, uh, what do you think? Any, uh, any more comments? Um, No, I, I think that's pretty much it. Um, okay, if there's a chance to, I guess, just talk a little bit about um, uh, my father or my 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 grandfather's service, um, or um, I don't think that'll hurt. You can okay tell a story or two. That works. Um, my dad was in uh, 20, 24 Corps, which was uh, based out of Da Nang, um, and I did a lot of research while I was in college. Uh, took some history of Vietnam classes and some stuff. Um, he uh, apparently, in the time that he was there, he, the, the base had been bombed um, or attacked uh, at some point, and the warehouse that was uh, uh, holding all the uh, Agent Orange for the, the spring on the jungles was uh, one of the targets, and it got uh, kind of got into the drinking water, kind of got into the food supply, and kind of really impacted everybody's life. And I've, talked with a bunch of veterans from that area at that time and um, a lot of them uh, a lot of them came back with with some pretty uh, heavy duty physical ailments and some of them were even passed on to their children which is an awful shame but uh, my grandpa also was uh, he was in World War II and he was uh, he fought with uh, Butch O'Hare's uh, fighting I think it's fighting six uh, VF6. I'm not sure. I think uh, I'm pretty sure that's right. But he was uh, he was a chief. He was a radio chief in the Navy. Um, it was his responsibility to fix the planes that came back broken too, kind of just like me. He was very proud of me when I went in. Um, was excited when I came back on leave. Wanted to hear all about it. Um, really missed those days. He was stationed on the USS Arizona um, and was transferred off of that months before Pearl Harbor. So he felt. Uh, um, a lot of pain when that ship went down. Um, went back many, many years later, and uh, uh, sobbed with grief because of all his shipmates that were lost. Mm -hmm. So um, I wish they could have been around to do uh, this Veterans History Project, because they both would have, would have had some serious stories to tell. And uh, But I'm, I'm glad this was. Glad this has done the, the history project. Okay. That's very neat. I was happy to have you. Thanks for doing the show. Thank you.